Hey everyone, we've partnered with Medify for season two of Between Us. I think it's fitting to be talking about Medify on our two-part episode about bipolar disorder, because it's an app that really strengthens your ability to be connected and aware of emotional changes. I like it because it has really nuanced and descriptive language. Medify, M-E-T-A-F-I, is a free download on iOS and Android. So go download it today and be your best self. A therapist told me this once, and it stuck with me. She said, you've got a 100% track record of getting through the worst day of your life. Imagine having a mood system that functions essentially like weather, you know, so independently of whatever's going on in your life. So the facts of your life stay the same, just the emotional fiction that you're responding to differs. It's like I'm not properly insulated. So all the bad and the good ways that you and most of the people in the adjacent neighborhoods and around the world feel, that pours directly into my system unchecked. It is so fun. I call it getting on my grid or ESP, egregious sensory protection. But ultimately, I feel I'm very sane about how crazy I am. But periodically, I do explode. Now, the good news about this is that over time, the explosions have gotten smaller and the recovery time is faster. But what is guaranteed is that I will explode. This is Between Us. I'm John Totten. My first break was in uh, 1977, 40 years ago. When I first reached out to the Seattle branch of the National Alliance on Mental Illness to ask if they had volunteers who would be interested in sharing their stories of bipolar disorder, I quickly received eager messages from the three men in our episode today. And after hearing their stories, I understood that eagerness. Not only are they committed to destigmatizing and demythologizing some of the assumptions we have about mental illness, but they also have stories that are at times harrowing. I would want to share them too, much in the same way that I might be eager to tell you about my day if I had almost died in a car wreck. And the reason their stories don't end tragically, pretty much in all three cases, is because of the support of their family and friends. The fact that they were able to lean on their support systems and also their own senses of optimism about their mental illness made their mental health not only manageable, in some cases easy. That's not always the case. In my early years working with men and women on probation, it was common to encounter those suffering from bipolar disorder without the support or education to get a handle on the illness. Often this led to addiction and cycling through the criminal justice system. Our guests today have proudly overcome those dangers and now give back through volunteer work with NAMI's In Our Own Voice program. So they've practiced telling their stories. And you can tell, as I was editing this two-part episode, my partner kept remarking at how much she heard me say the word, wow, to our guests. She said that it sounded like I was doing my own Wilson impression. And while we tried to spare your ears of all my exclamations, some of these stories are wow-worthy. We spoke to three men of three different generations. Our first guest, Steve Murphy, has gotten to the point where taking care of his mental health is second nature. He's my dad's age and a successful business owner here in Seattle, but he wasn't always on top of things. Here he is. I I am a native Seattleite, mm-hmm. and I uh, left home in about when I was 20. The reason I went was to ski in Colorado, so I spent two seasons in a destination resort in Colorado. Hooked up with a construction company that was building coal processing facilities, industrial facilities. Mm-hmm. They finished the job in Colorado, and I, I I moved out to Pennsylvania for the next one, and we broke ground and uh, finished it in about a year and a half. It was a pretty good-sized construction job. And on that job... I was a laborer to begin with, but I always rose to the top. Mm-hmm. 
on that site, they found out I could type. And so they asked me to come in the office and be a clerk. Hmm. And I said, well, great, because I get out of the weather. Right. Because it was cold. It's cold in Pennsylvania. Right. So then that job finished, and they moved that team to Corbin, Kentucky, mm-hmm. heart of coal land. And by the time I got there, nobody really knew me more than a year or so. And I had my first manic, full-blown manic episode. It was a doozy. What did it consist of? Well, uh, I stopped eating. I stopped sleeping. There's a symptom in uh, the manic side of bipolar mm-hmm. called rapid speech where you talk fast, you change subjects, you talk over everyone, and you're kind of just generally pretty annoying. (laughs) Uh, Lost my job, spent a lot of money, and finally somebody from home called and said, maybe you should come home. And so I got on an airplane in Nashville, I think. That was the biggest airport close by. And had what should have been a 40-minute layover in Chicago O'Hare. Turned out to be six hours. There was a woman waiting for me when I should have arrived in SeaTac. I did some really wild stuff in, in the Chicago Air, O'Hare Airport. It was, it was a lucky thing that TSA wasn't around then. or Just, the, just during the layover? Six hours. Yeah. I messed around. So one of the things I did was I thought they were following me around. And so I, I'll buy a ticket to another city under somebody else's name. So I did. <laughs> As it turns out, they weren't following me around then, but by the end of it, they were. Within two minutes of meeting Jeff Hicks, we found that we had plenty of similarities. We were both born at the tail end of Generation X in the early 80s. We both grew up in Tennessee, and we went to undergrad at the University of Tennessee. Jeff was even a photographer at the school newspaper where my co-producer Mason was a staff writer as well. They don't remember each other. It was a big school. Jeff gave a talk for Ignite Seattle called After the Psych Ward. You can go and look it up on YouTube if you want. Here he is. What was your childhood like growing up in Memphis? You know, it was a great childhood, honestly. Except for one major, major life event, which would be the death of my brother when I was five. Yeah, and that's something that I found therapy has helped me with. Yeah. But otherwise, uh, my parents were are great. I still have a close relationship with them today. We grew up in a house with a, you know, a nice backyard, and so I'd play in the yard. And you know, when I got older, I had to cut that yard. Right. <laughs> that's yeah. That's, that's another <laughs> thing. But uh, it was a good childhood. You know, it was a childhood in the '80s. We didn't have cell phones. I'd go. I'd be like, Hey, I'm going over to my friend's house. I'd be. I'll be back in a few hours. And you know, you're. Your mom would have his mom's number, and it was a, I think it was a good time to be a kid. Absolutely. It was definitely a good time to be a kid. So I liked my childhood. Climbing trees, that kind of thing. The idea of mental health problems was completely foreign to you. Oh, completely foreign until, until the major episode. It was in November of 2011, uh, right around Thanksgiving, and I started getting more and more energy, and I didn't need to sleep. And I had all these great ideas and started spending money and calling people at all hours of the evening and started to see meaning in everything. And in hindsight, it was delusions of grandeur and a slow slide into uh, madness, if if nothing else. Uh, And it's been a journey for me. Um, I have had three manic episodes, one in 2011, the first. I was hospitalized for two weeks, uh, maybe three weeks. I, I can't recall. Three, I believe, the first time. 2013, I had another one in the summer. And nothing and nothing before that? Nothing identifiable as an episode, no. I mean, hypomania, maybe. I, I've always been really high energy prone to uh, being somewhat impulsive mm-hmm. um, and following through on things that I, that I start to do, although sometimes it happens, things in my life happen very quickly. So what started as a manic episode is hypomania sliding into full-blown mania. Could have just been quirks of who I am naturally. So hard to identify is what I'm saying in me. So it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. The first time, Mm -hmm. what was your awareness of what was happening? Well, the first time, I didn't think there was anything wrong. I thought I had discovered some secret of the universe that nobody else knew and was headed towards this. I had these grandiose ambitions of 
it was like a game of connect the dots in my brain. All these different disparate ideas were piecing together and they seemed so right. They seemed so, and it's hard to explain really. The, uh, the, f- the first episode, I wasn't aware of anything wrong. It felt so good um, that I thought people just didn't understand these ideas I was having. People just were trying to help me, my friends. They're like, Jeff, something's wrong. We, you, know, you haven't slept in days. You're, you're losing weight rapidly. You were rushing around the house. You're writing all the mirrors and the windows, all these ideas that you're having, these books you're gonna write. You, know, you just bought a school bus, for example. I bought a school bus during my manic episode. You bought a school bus? A 25-foot 2001 Bluebird school bus. Did you have the money for it? I, got, I picked it up for $1,700. <laughs> but yes, I did. I, what I'd was been your in, plan with the school bus at the time? Uh, I, you know, I actually used it for what my plan for it was, which I, I go to a lot of festivals. Mm-hmm. And so we took the school bus and, and went to festivals. Uh, but we did take a road trip from Seattle to San Diego in this 25-foot school bus. Took it to Arizona for a music festival and then sold it in, uh, in San Diego for eight grand. What? Yeah, all I did was put a couch in it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you made a six, $6,300 profit yeah. on the school bus. Uh-huh. And I put an alternator in it, so... So I can only imagine that if you're manic and you're doing these things, you're thinking you are like, you're like Superman. If you're like yeah. making $6,000 profits on a used school bus. Well, that was over the course of a year, not a manic episode. Yeah, you, you spend money like you don't think about budgets or where it might come from. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a, a sales job and I was good at it. And so I did have the finances to do things like that. So I know of people who have bought cars during manic episodes, who bought houses during manic episodes. Sure. It can really really take a toll financially. Oh, you want a good example of, of sure. excessive spending and impulsive, well, not impulsivity, because I thought about it for a long time, and I bought 10,000 lighters. Jeff's idea for the 10,000 lighters wasn't that delusional, just extremely ambitious and grandiose. Sometimes, though, bipolar disorder does include delusions. Our third guest, Nick Ryder, is also our youngest, and have suffered from paranoid delusions in the past. I think what is stark about these stories for me is that sometimes they sound fun, and sometimes they sound terrifying. That's just another aspect of the different extremes those who struggle with it experience. There are no road trips in a bus in Nick's stories, and yet the way he has processed his experiences and learned from them is something truly special. So my name is Nick, I'm 23 years old, I grew up for most of my life in Issaquah, Washington, which uh, I love that area. I think it's a really beautiful area. And um, I was born in Kentucky. Um, We moved around based on my dad's work, um, which brought us to Belgium for a while, to Connecticut, to Ohio, and eventually for to Issaquah. And uh, that really has had an influence on me because I see myself as a community-oriented person and someone who really gets a lot of his value out of the time he shares with other people. And before living in Issaquah, I had made friends with people and then had to leave those friendships. Mm -hmm. And that was really hard for me growing up. And so Issaquah, I kind of see as like a real fertile ground for me growing up and starting to really have close connections with people. So you're studying to be a therapist, right? A music therapist. How far back does that go? It started with Guitar Hero. Guitar Hero? (laughs) Yeah, in my early teens. (laughs) So I'm guessing that led to actual guitar? Yes. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about your, like, mental health history and your awareness of it and what that has been like. My particular story and the way that I view my mental health uh, journey started as a coming-of-age story and started when I was um, moving away from from home to go to college in Boston. And um, I've heard some people tell their stories like, I've always known I was different, or I've always had this aspect of myself that has been changed, has been different than other people. And I don't particularly feel that way. I feel that my illness came about a largely environmentally produced, and maybe I had a propensity towards the illness, mm-hmm. but I 
was um, triggered by a number of different factors that I can point to in my life that led to an unraveling of my mental health and um, has led to a lot of confusion, a lot of stuff that I can't point to clearly and say that was what caused it. But I do believe that there are some specific points that influence my, my unraveling, as I mentioned. So I think point number one was when I moved across the coast, across the U.S. to the East Coast to go to college, that was when I first started noticing myself acting differently than I did, than what I identified with. Um, for example, uh, drinking and, and starting and in, engaging in that culture, going out more, staying out later, experimenting with marijuana. That was something that led to different states of being that I hadn't had much experience with before. I had ended a, a close relationship with a, a young woman. That was a really tough uh, experience for me, was stopping that close relationship and moving to the other side of the country. Mm-hmm. And then being away from my family too, my close my close compadres, my mom and my dad, um, having not having that uh, connection was uh, also started me on that path. And then what? And then what came next? You know, it's tricky to say because what do I label as 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 regular behavior, and what do I label as irregular behavior? But I mean, the drinking, the experimenting with drugs, the having trouble with the breakup. I mean, these are normal occurrences. What happened next? I mean, I just kind of continued on that path. Uh, that I was on, and, and I did start to wake up to, uh, wow, I'm actually, my grades are slipping a little bit, and my parents aren't happy with, happy with me. At one point, was there a manic episode? Yes. So, I was living in Berkeley, California at the time, and I had dropped out of school, taken all my money out of the bank, and uh, got an apartment in Berkeley, California. And the, the episode, manic episode happened over a period of a couple days. One of the first days, I, uh, I woke up, felt differently, went into work. I remember that it was a Tuesday because we had a, uh, a meeting. Previous to that, I had had a tough time sleeping. I had had some other triggers, and I was, uh, in, the, in the moment, during the meeting, I thought I was in a different dimension. I remember vividly thinking that I was in this different dimension and that a couple of the people in the company that I felt most strongly towards were in it with me. And I specifically thought that we were part of a secret group that was going to work towards creating a robot that was going to positively affect the world. Mm -hmm. And it was really exciting because I'm like, oh, yes, I made it onto the team. And now I'm going to be part of this group that is um, helping save the world. And... I remember then there was also a a new person in the meeting who was a new person to the company, and I thought that this person was an infiltrator to the meeting, and so I was looking at them, and I was, remember staring at them very vehemently, and was thinking that, wow, this person is not part of the team, and I'm I'm not going to be very kind towards them. Um, So that continued for for the meeting, and I, I was actually in that state of mind, just kind of stewing for maybe 30 minutes. And then the meeting ended, and I ended up staying in the state of mind for about an hour, communicating with other people in the, in the company, and, and I was in my own world, and they didn't even know that I was thinking I was in a different dimension, and that I was seeing space differently, and was part of the secret team. I was talking to them in ways in which they just didn't understand that I was in a very compromised position. Did you, and you never mentioned the robot or anything to them? You happened to stay kind of incognito? <laughs> For about an hour. Oh. But after the hour, I, another coworker ended up hearing my words and was thinking, eh, something about this doesn't sound right, and spoke to the supervisor. The supervisor approaches me, and I'm sitting on a couch next to the supervisor and I fear, feel this just fire going up and down with just this anxiety in my chest and I'm talking to her about the robot and she's saying, Nick, 
are you okay? Do you have maybe an illness? And do you have a history of an illness? And that interaction started the kind of decline of the episode where I started to get some self-awareness as to what was going on with me and then ended up sleeping because I was sleep deprived and um, started getting into a more uh, normal state of mind. Maybe if it was like a graph, there would be different peaks and valleys Mm -hmm. on the graph. And this was the peak of the graph. Afterwards, what was your awareness of what had happened? There was embarrassment, Mm -hmm. there's fear, Mm -hmm. there was, what am I going to tell my parents? Sure. Some of it I don't remember exactly, but the feeling and that that column of anxiety I remember just so vividly. Mm -hmm. It even had a color, and um, the feelings of embarrassment and remembering that I called my parents after I had woken up, after I had taken the nap. Um, that I remember, yeah, it's 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 pretty hodgepodge, but a lot of it is still inside. When Carrie Fisher died in December of 2016, she was remembered as a sci-fi legend and an authentic and singular personality who was candid about her own issues of addiction and mental illness. Like many people, Fisher actually drank and used drugs to self-medicate her mental illness, which went undiagnosed until 1985. Later, she would give names to the two extremes of her bipolar moods. She called her elevated mood Roy and her deflated mood Pam, saying Roy is the one who decorates the house and Pam is the one who has to live in it. She spent much of her public life normalizing the diagnosis and the corresponding medications, telling an interviewer in 2002, there is a treatment and a variety of medications that can alleviate your symptoms. You can lead a normal life, whatever that is. Here's more from Jeff with one of the 10,000 lighters he purchased. What was your plan with 10,000 lighters? Uh, Well, actually, I've got one on me. The lighters are kind of unique. They've got green flames. Give me a second. Oh, Oh, there it is. It's got a green flame. It's called a color flame lighter, and I'd never seen one before. And, yeah, they're all green. And it was 2013. Uh, Marijuana had just become legal, and I'm like, green flame? Marijuana smokers, pot shops, I'll sell these lighters to local pot shops uh, and make a profit on them because I bought in bulk. All the ideas you were having, uh, I mean, they're not, they're not insane. No. You had, you had a plan. They're just grandiose plans. They're and, grandiose. And sometimes you get so excited about the beginning and getting things rolling that you don't follow through. At least I didn't follow through. Mm-hmm. So I did sell a number of them to pot shops. I gave a number away, traded some for some things for people who, uh, somebody wanted to rebrand them and use them in their pot shops. So I did trade and sell and for a while. Uh, eventually, I just realized these are kind of unique lighters, and so at festivals, I give them away as gifts. Is generosity part of who you are? Is it amplified when you're feeling manic? It is amplified when you're feeling manic. I'd say uh, mania is a condition that lends itself to extremes. Uh, extremes of usually happiness for me, but bipolar disorder also lends itself to the other extreme, to depression, which I've been through once. But for me, bipolar one, I'm much more prone to mania, to feelings of grandiosity, to excessive spending, to generosity, to your question. Yeah. I think it it brings out who you are more in some ways. But it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous. I wasn't drinking water. I wasn't eating the first Dianic episode because I was so intently focused on these ideas that I was having, these blossoming realizations about the world. Were you sleeping? No. Not for five days. You would go five days without sleep? That first time I went five days without sleeping. And I wasn't particularly tired. You're not aware of it because it feels great, I'm assuming. And it's a slow build. Yeah. It's not just you wake up and you're psychotic. It's a really slow build for me. Yeah. So when I start to catch myself sliding a little bit, ups and downs throughout the day, I will usually try and take a nap if I can, because it kind of resets me. So that first time, where did it go? I mean, you said your friends came to you. Yeah, so 
kind of a funny story, actually. My uh, my friends, one friend uh, came over and confronted me. You know, from head on, head on. Something's wrong with you. No, these ideas are that you're writing on the mirrors and windows or make no sense to anyone. Uh, you need help. And I was so enthralled by my own what felt like greatness at the time that I you know rejected his confrontation and and it was not the right approach to take at that point in time. So other friends were, were coming over and trying to use logic and following through and trying to figure out where I'm coming from in some ways until one friend, with the help of another, said, hey, Jeff, I'll tell you what. If you go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist with us and they tell us that you're brilliant and that these ideas are absolutely brilliant, then we will help you bring them to fruition. But you need to do that first or we'll help you. And I'm like, okay, that's a great idea. So we jump in my friend's car. They take me over to Harborview. They take me to the hospital. Uh, and I was rapidly admitted into the psychiatric emergency services ward. There's a telephone at the psychiatric emergency services ward. And I, I, I called uh, security one day. I said, security, I'm being held against my will. You know, you have to come get me. And they're like, where are you? I'm like, in the psychiatric emergency services ward. <laughs> You were technically telling the truth. It yeah. Just, the context was uh, foggy for you. A little foggy. And the nurse came over and said, Jeff, you got to stop doing that. Fine. Try some other way to escape. I tried to escape every time I've ever been in a hospital. Every time? Yeah, I'm sure in my medical history it says escape risk. So your friends were proven right. Is there any awareness for you that they've been right? It slowly dawned on me over time, but not at first. Not when I was in the hospital really, but I trusted my family. So my dad, my stepmom, a lot of, a lot of closeness in my family, I trusted them and they said, Jeff, you need to be here. And in hindsight, you know, there's no, there's no hurt feelings, there's no animosity, but at the time I was really unhappy. Were you angry? Not like, physically or violently angry, but yeah, I was, I was, I've gone through the whole gamut of emotions when it comes to feeling bipolar disorder. The, the timeline for me would have been Committed in November of 2011, released in December, and I thought that means I'm fine. Oh, I'm cured, you know, because I, I didn't know what bipolar was. I knew it was called manic depression, and I got an idea about it. They gave me a book in the hospital, and I remember reading that book a month or two after I got out, because I'm like, maybe I should learn more about this. Hmm. And I read some of the exact same things that I had said and done in the book and threw it across the room because I was angry. I was angry at what had happened to me. Bipolar disorder, which Jimi Hendrix and earlier doctors referred to as manic depression, is still somewhat of a mystery. It is generally believed to be caused by the disruption of circuits in the brain that are involved in the control of neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. The symptoms for a manic episode include things like elevated mood, increased sense of grandiosity, talking fast like Steve described, not sleeping at all, an impulsive behavior, like buying 10,000 lighters. A depressive episode includes things like lack of interest and motivation in life, lack of energy, and thinking really negative or even suicidal thoughts. Here's more from Nick about the onset of his illness in California. What did you tell your parents? I called them from California from one of our meeting rooms, and I remember being very confused and remember saying the words manic depressive illness because my supervisor had used that word. And I was like, I don't know what this is. And was just very embarrassed to share with them the actual details of the robot and the, the, the different dimension. I mean, those are details that it's even embarrassing now to share. And what did they say? They said, uh, like, we're going to get you help. And you say it kind of like with this raw, raw kind of cheerleading yeah. gesture, which sometimes can be sarcastic yeah yeah so part of my episode was due to my parents having 
difficulty with me moving out of home and dropping out of school. Part of my immense recovery has been my parents being willing to help me in ways in which seeing therapy and trying medication and being on my side and going to my appointments with me. And so I'm not resentful of them. They've been an immense help. But I also acknowledge that they they were just a part of my unraveling. Hmm. And help at the time looked at starting therapy with a therapist. Although this first episode was really just the unlocking of a door which opened up about a year and a half of other episodes, going into hospitals, trying different medications, rebelling against the diagnosis, rebelling against the medication, and that was really the first experience that led to this. That, that was the only strange thing. That, that was probably one of the strangest. So anyway, I turned myself in and I explained the situation. And they actually called SeaTac and paged the woman that was hopefully still waiting for me. And she was. And she vouched for me. Wouldn't happen today. But they gave me the money back for the ticket and they put me on a plane to Seattle. Wow. One of numerous, un uncounted, a lucky breaks for me. So I got to Seattle, and I, I was in a locked ward within about 24 hours. So that's the, that's the dark day story. And so where did it go from there in terms of your interaction with the illness? Well, I was in the locked ward for two weeks. That'll change it. And I knew that my behavior in Corbin was so out of character that my life had changed forever. Really didn't know what it was going to look like, but I knew it was going to change I had some help from a resident psychiatrist just getting at the end of his learning, and he helped me a great deal when I was there. He talked to me a lot about what the illness looked like and what you could expect for this, that, and the other thing. And so that helped me on acceptance. What I felt was genuine interest in, mm. in what I was going through. At that time, I also started reading everything I could get. Yeah? Was that the way you were before that? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. I, I and I knew, and I knew I had to know more about the illness before I could truly get better. There had to have been much more of a stigma back then than there is now. I mean, there is now, but well, you choose to disclose, and I didn't disclose very much. Yeah. So I was gone for four years. All of a sudden, I come back, and I, and most people wouldn't know that I was in the psych ward, right. and so I wouldn't talk about it. And in my work. Never, never mentioned it. You were, were you taking medication? Oh yeah, I, I've I've taken the medication that's mood stabilizer for four years. And so, have you had a manic episode since the first one? Oh sure. Early on, they were not quite so intense, and later, it was just a heightened energy level, and mm -hmm. and I knew I was, uh, and I think they call it hypomanic right. rather than manic. But I I did have for for a long time, and for many years. I was what's called a rapid cycler, where you have three or four of your cycles every year. Mm -hmm. none, of, none of it was debilitating. It was just euphoric. You felt great. I felt great, and I did great stuff. I've never spent a day in jail, uh, never been in trouble with the law. I guess that's kind of in my nature from the beginning. Where did you go from there? I mean... What was the acceptance process like? I ended up in February, I tried to go back to work on January, just a short while after getting into the hospital, because that was part of saying nothing's wrong with me. No, I'm fine, I can go back to work. They let me out of the hospital and was not the same person, could not operate at the same level because of the medications I was on, because of the psychotic break I had, potentially damaged my you know, brain from, what it, from the spinning up of the mania. February, I ended up taking a short-term leave of absence from work for a few months and then slid into a depression in January that led me to that leave of absence in February. My first and only depression. We'll have more with our guests on the next episode. This has been Between Us. Our sincere thanks to Steve, Jeff, and Nick, and to our sponsor, Medify. Medify is a free download on iOS and Android. Go get it today. Between Us is produced by myself and Mason Neely, who also composed our music. Next time, 
on Between Us. And so I had a period of psychosis where I was running around my neighborhood in my boxers, thinking people were after me with guns and cutting my legs up on thorns as I was running away from people. 